Okay, hello. Um, I'll ask as usual before I start whether there's any questions about the course. Oh, and I should, well, uh, presumably the people who really need to hear this apology are, are not watching live now, but I still haven't put up the recording from Tuesday. I'm going to try to take care of that tonight. Um, as well as getting the recording from, from today up. Um, so are there any questions about, uh, you know, administrative issues or anything like that? Okay, so... Actually, maybe I shouldn't have erased that because the first thing I want to do is say if few things about uh, that I didn't get to at the end last time. Um, mostly about Carnap's response to Neurath's criticisms. Um, so I think, I mean, he responds both on a technical level, this is most of the response that's visible. He responds on a technical level by adjusting the details of the proposed system language uh, or adjusting the nature of what's being proposed. But And then there's also, but this is much more muted, perhaps a response to Neurod's political position. So um, so the, the technical response um, on the one hand it's from Carnap's point of view he, he actually changes his opinion about a lot of things in response to this criticism. From Neurath's point of view it probably doesn't go nearly far enough but um, the first thing and perhaps most important thing that he changes is that whereas in um, the unity of science he was still saying what he said in the Aufbau about the nature of the given namely that this is an empirical issue um, Actually, sir, 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 sir. Uh, yeah I think I could believe well hold on a second are people talking to me, or is that just background noise? Okay, I just muted any everyone, but if you want, you can unmute yourself and say something. Um, okay, but so he was still saying in the unity of science that, you know, uh, it's a matter for further empirical research, at least it sounds like he means empirical research, what is the actual content of the given? You know, is the content of the given these like atomic uh, sentences like pain here now, or is the content of the given what he said in the Aufbau, which is these, you know, gestalts of the, gestalt in German actually means shape, not whole, but anyway, never mind that. So uh, these like, uh, um, entire elementary experiences, or maybe the content of the given is actually, this is a possibility he didn't even mention in the Aufbau, but the, po the content of the given is basically what in the Aufbau is called the thing world, right? It's like three-dimensional colored objects with other sensible properties is the content of the given. That's what's immediately given to us. So, right, so all those seem like empirical possibilities, like possibilities to be settled by empirical psychology in the unity of science. But in his response to Neurot, he makes it clear, and I think this is a change, that the question of what the protocol sentences are going to contain is a matter of convention. So it's one of the things we're going to decide when we adopt the language what things to include as protocol sentences. 
Now, I mean, results of empirical psychology might have some kind of bearing on that, but, uh, but only indirectly. There's all kinds of considerations, right? And so, um, and he makes that move because what he wants to say is that Neurath's form of the protocol senses, right? At time T, Otto wrote in his protocol, at time T1, Otto said to himself, at time T2, there was a red ball on the table, right? That whole long thing, Carnaps wants to say, well, um, that's neither right nor wrong. It's neither true nor false that those are the protocol sentences. That should be interpreted as a proposed uh, convention or stipulation about what's going, what a protocol sentence is going to look like. Um, and that's on the way to saying. So you see, um, Otto, <laughs> uh, you and I don't disagree about anything theoretical here. We're, we're just making different practical proposals. And as a matter of fact, each one of them has its advantages or has advantages for certain purposes. Um, so that's how we should regard the question. Um, in other words, uh, you could see this as a kind of dig at Neurath that like actually Neurath, what you were doing was metaphysics. <laughs> Right, you were treating a practical question as a theoretical one, except that he's kind of admitting that he made the same mistake himself in the unity of science. So, um, okay, I mean, I guess I still don't really have time to go into this in detail if I want to get to the material for this week, <laughs> um, but. Uh, but roughly speaking, so what Carnap does is um, he says, so there's two big possibilities. And again, it's a matter of convention or stipulation um, which one of these we adopt. Invisible, there you go. Um, and the first one is that we're going to separate the um, system language and the protocol language. And we're going to say, um, um, Uh, the protocol language is uh, some signals that I talked about this last time, some signals that some machine or human being or animal or whatever is giving off in response to its environment. And we're going to take some of those, um, presumably the ones that are, that are produced pretty reliably in response to common changes in the environment and we're going to adopt translations of those into the system language and so those signals that this thing is giving off uh, I mean I don't know if you should even necessarily call them signals before we decide in other words the protocol language is we are treating it as a language because we are treating it as at least possibly having a structure to it so that one part of the sentence means it is snowing and the other part means hard, right? That is, these translations are going to assume perhaps that there's some structure to these signals. So in that, in that sense, they're like a language. But... Um, but we're not assuming that whatever is giving them off intends to communicate with us, for example. Um, and in that sense, we're not really treating the protocol language as a language. Whereas the system language is the language we're adopting with the intention to communicate with each other. Um, 
So, but anyway, so that one possibility is that we take these signals that this thing is giving off and we adopt a convention to translate them into um, uh, sentences of the system language. And we call the signals that we're adopting that convention for the protocol sentences. So now, I mean, uh, Unless some question arises, which it can, as Carnat mentions, but unless some question arises as to whether that thing actually gave off that signal or not, right? Like, did the machine really turn its disk to say, you know, to the part that says Ray or didn't it? Um, well, um, um, unless a question like that arises, nothing that happens can can constitute a challenge to the protocol sentence right because the protocol sentence is just this you know signal that this thing displayed or emitted or whatever and um uh you can't say oh it turned out to be false so this is Carnap's interpretation now of, you know, it's, again, it sounded like in the unity of science, he still thought, as he definitely thinks in the Aufbau, in a sense, the content of the protocol sentences is stuff we can't be wrong about, and that's why it's not going to be subject to testing. Why can't we be wrong about it? Because it's immediately given to us. Right? And how do we know it's immediately given to us? Well, empirical psychology. Now he's saying, no, that's not the way we should look at, you know, that's not what I should have been trying to say there anyway. What I should have been trying to say here is on this proposal, the protocol sentence can't be tested because they're not part of the language we're using to communicate and we don't have procedures in our language for, for saying that these things are true or false. All we have is translation conventions. Now, I mean, the system sentence we translated it into could turn out to be false. But in that case, Carnap is saying on this procedure, we at least ha always have the option of changing the translation rules. So, for example, you know, Carl emits this sentence in Carl's protocol language that said, you know, that we used to translate as, it is raining. But we find out it's not raining. So, um, so we change, so it is raining is a sentence of the system language. We, ch we translated this sound that Carl makes into the system language sentence, it is raining. Um, now we find out that Carl emitted this sentence, this sound, when it wasn't raining. So we changed the translation into the system language to something like, well, and one way it can go is, it seems to Carl that it is raining. Carl's brain is in a state that it would be in normally if it were raining, something like that. Um, right, this is what he calls the B rules. B, I guess, stands for brain. <laughs> the B rules are the rules that, you know, we're going to translate the sentences of the protocol language into statements about Carl, maybe it stands for body, into statements about Car the state of Carl's body or brain. Um, uh, you know, another... I guess this is another independent possibility or anyway we can definitely we might have to do both of these we translate it into the sentence uh it is raining or carl is lying <laughs> right or it seems to carl that it's raining or carl is lying <laughs> right so the possibility that carl is lying may be have to be built into our translation rules on this proposal but by if we go that far then we can protect it Carl's original protocol sentence, we can say, well, we don't reject it. We just change our mind about what it meant. 
So Carnap says this has certain advantages. The main advantage of it, I think, is that it's very tolerant. We can allow the people who aren't us, who aren't like the Vienna Circle or whoever it is who's adopting this system language to speak however they want. Um, we can count anyone we want as um, anyone or anything actually that we want as producing protocol sentences. Um, we, don't, we don't need any power over, we don't need the power to retrain people or to reprogram machines. Um, uh, we can, you know, it's almost kind of like the advantage of this is, is a stoic type of advantage. <laughs> we're, we're putting all investment in the thing that we actually have control over, namely our own will to adopt a language not in the other things that are outside our control, like how, what noises Carl makes. Um, but he says, on the other hand, now I understand what you mean, Neurot. See, uh, or this is, again, maybe like what you should have meant, Neurot. You have a different proposal. We're going to only have the system left. And we're going to um, not count anyone as producing protocol sentences unless we can get them to speak the system language with us. Um, so uh, what, now what we call protocol sentences will be sentences of the system language. And these, again, will be sentences of the system language. And then Carnap says, well, actually, there's two possibilities. And he, um, and he puts Neurot in the A branch here. I'll call one of those special protocol sentences. And the other one is uh, anything can be a protocol sentence. Right, so he says, he interprets Neurot as meaning a version of this. Certain system sentences should be adopted as protocol sentences, and those system sentences will all be of the form uh, at time t, Otto wrote in his protocol. At time t1, Otto said to himself, at time t2, there is a red ball on the table. Right. Um, so he's saying, so he says, and I think there's some irony here. Um, Carnap is, uh, one of the things about Carnap as an author, I probably should have said this before we started reading him, but he does sometimes have a sense of really understated irony. <laughs> so he's, you know, he says, well, there are some things to be said in favor of this proposal of Neurot's, whereas what he actually means is how bizarre. Why would you treat those the right? The, why would you why would you require all the protocol sentences to have that weird form? <laughs> um, but anyway, but he says, you know, after discussing these issues with Karl Popper, who's coming up later in the course, and by the way, uh, we'll see Popper. Um, Popper's response to this was that Carnap completely misunderstood what he meant. <laughs> but in any case, he says, after discussing these things with Popper, I realized there's another alternative, which I think actually is really good, which is that we allow any statement of the system language to be considered a protocol sentence. Now, how is this going to work, you might think? Like, you mean any statement of the system language is not subject to testing or something like that? Well, no, I mean, that even on this alternative, that's not true. That was part of Neurot's point, right? Like, those sentences of that weird form can be false, and they might have to be tested. Um, so, uh, 
But what Carnap says in this case, what you know, we're going to take advantage of that to say that the protocol can contain anything you want by convention. It's kind of like a case by case convention, I think, right? That is, we can all, we scientific men who speak the system language, can agree for now to treat so and so as a protocol sentence. And that means we can use it to test theories and so on and so forth. Now, or I don't know if there's any so on and so forth, we can use it to test theories, right? So, um, as long as that seems convenient, at some point, when, as we would normally say, doubts arise about the truth of that sentence, or as Carnap, I think, would say, um, it does say, uh, contradictions come up between that sentence and other sentences we want to adopt, either theoretical sentences or other protocol things we want to adopt as protocol sentences, then, you know, uh, when that happens, it uh, we have an option which one of those to reject. That's a again as a practical decision. We have to decide which is best, which best conduces to our purposes, but like ultimately maybe what which is ethically best. <laughs> um, uh, and but one of our options will be to say, okay, we're not going to treat this as a protocol se sentence anymore. We're going to treat it as a theoretical statement in its own right. And we're going to look for evidence for or against it. Um, okay, that went longer than it should have. I guess I was going to say something about response on the political level. Um, well, and also I was going to say something about why this is not going to be satisfactory to Neurot. I feel like... Um, I don't have time to say that, so, uh, but I mean, I already mentioned what I take to be the place where, again, like, ironically presented, the, um, the main political response to Neurot is going to be, which is in that place where he says that, you know, as is well known, this procedure sometimes succeeds with humans or with animals. Um, Maybe from this point of view, you could actually see this thing that worries me about the Negro. Did I did I mention that last time? The sentence about the utterances of the Negro in an unknown language? Briefly. Okay, so I did mention it. Yeah, so it's worrying because it comes next to like animals or children or the utterances of a Negro in an unknown language. It seems like, you know, uh, what we're saying is various kinds of primitive or substandard languages can be accepted. But maybe this is actually part of the political response to Neurot, now that I think of it. The point is, uh, if you adopt Neurot's proposal, as Carnap is understanding it, you are... Um, uh, trying to take on the authority to treat everyone else that you talk to as if they were, uh, you know, animals that you were training. This is, this is like an old, and you know, there's the same issue in Plato, whether he whether you're supposed to think, oh, that's great, when Socrates draws these analogies between training horses and teaching our children, or whether, as I think, you're supposed to notice that, wow, there's something really weird about that analogy. <laughs> but anyway, so like this, this is an old, old philosophical issue about, starting in Plato about the relationship between training non-human animals and training especially domesticated non-human animals, right? That is animals that we're treating as there for our purposes. <laughs> um, um, between that and the way we treat uh, other humans, so anyway, um, and in that context, you might see the remark about the Negro as pointing out 
that uh, Neurath's position is basically imperialist, right? Among the people who might be forced to speak the system language are like whoever we can impose our will on by uh, colonizing them. <laughs> Um, let me, I just, there's something else I have to plug in my computer. All right. Um, so, you know, oops, what just happened? Um, so, I mean, that actually, especially I, this, I don't, I don't think I thought of this before, especially if that's what he means. Now, maybe I'm just really, oops. If that's really what he means, that could seem like an actually really pointed uh, critique of someone who is a uh, Stalinist, <laughs> basically, right? The, like, um, by someone who is who is a democratic socialist, you know, saying like, uh, um, what what you're doing is just as implicated, or is potentially just as implicated in uh, in violence and oppression as what Heidegger is doing. Oh. Uh, now there's a question here about a weird feed, ringing feedback noise. Are other people hearing a weird ringing feedback noise? Uh oh. What is making that? All I can think of is maybe switching which webcam mic I'm using. It just went away. Did the mic pl plug come loose? Well, I'm using the mic and the camera and the webcam. Anyway, is it still there? Oh. All right, let me try a different mic. Okay, how about that? Okay, now I'm using the mic and the computer. All right. Um, okay, sorry. So are there questions about that before uh, I go on to the new material? I think, again, maybe as someone put it before, that escalated pretty quickly. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, that's deliberate, right? I'm trying to, like, one of the things I'm trying to show is, like, why these people cared so much about these apparently, like, really obscure questions about the logic of, and methodology of scientific theories. Um, in their minds, at least, it was connected with things that it's clear why you would care about. Um, um, just as, you know, Kant tells you at the beginning of the first critique, at least in the B edition, it explains to you why you should care about this weird inquiry into transcendental logic that he's about to um, take you on because ultimately it ties back to things that everyone has a necessary interest in. Um, there's uh, things that people have a, an obligatory interest in, an ethical interest in. Okay. Having said that, I will go on to the new material. Um, so, uh, Right, so now this last um, paper by Carnap, um, the methodological character, um, 
of uh, theoretical concepts. This is 1956. So, um, whereas the Unity of Science is 19, this the original paper that's translating is 1932. So we've skipped uh, quite a bit of Carnap's career. Um, and, uh, you know, if you read this, I'm sure you noticed that in between things have become, you know, there have been a lot of changes, things mostly in the direction of things have become a lot more complicated. Um, um, the, I think all the technical complication that is in this paper, um, in some sense, it's interesting in its own right. I mean, it's the like it's the only example that uh, we're going to see of how logical positivism ended up in the end. After uh, this is this is practically the end of it. <laughs> um, it's certain it's at least almost Carnap's last word on these subjects. Um, so. Uh, um, and uh, the way it ended up is that all the things that at the time of the Aufbau seemed like, you know, we could quickly get past them and move on to this positive program turned out to be really, really difficult. And people spent all these decades working on new formulations and new, new formulations and whatever to still try to get back to the starting point, basically. Um, so that's one reason to read this, but the, another reason to read it is because I wanted to uh, talk about this paper by Hilary Putnam, um, What Theories Are Not. Um, that paper is uh, that paper's from 1962. Um, now, uh, I actually knew Hillary Putnam. He died, was it last year or two years ago? Pretty recently, but I actually knew Hillary Putnam. He was on my dissertation committee. Um, he was a very interesting character. Uh, I don't have time to, to say a lot about him or almost anything about him. But one thing I happen to have learned about him from a friend of my father's who, it's, it so happens, went to high school with him, <laughs> is that uh, um, his nickname in high school was Sit Down Hillary. <laughs> because apparently the teachers had to keep telling him to sit down and stop arguing. <laughs> Um, so, and that was definitely, well, at the time I knew him, I didn't know him in 1962. I had not been born yet in 1962. Um, so I knew him uh, a long time after that. Um, um, by the time I knew him, he had kind of two modes and one was like a softer, gentler mode that he would use to talk about. Levinas and stuff like that. But then if you mention something about set theory or whatever, the old, like, aggressive sit-down Hillary would come back. So, I mean, this paper, which was published when he was a relatively young man attacking, a, you know, an old established classic figure in the field, Carnap. He actually told me that when he met Carnap, he was terrified of him. <laughs> but obviously, he was able to get it over that by the time he wrote this paper. Um, so, uh, um, and this paper is interesting, and I think it was quite influential. Um, and the version of Carnap that he's directly attacking is this 1956 version. Because, he, you know, I, reasonably enough, he says, if I'm going to attack it, I guess, you know, I should attack the latest, most improved version. <sighs> okay. Um, so having said all of that, um, I want to say something about the version of Carnap's project that you see in the methodological character paper. Um, but um, 
without spending so much time on that that I can't get to Putnam's criticisms. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'll say just broadly, first of all, what has not changed between this and the older Carnap papers? A lot of things have not changed. Um, the unity of science has not changed, right? There's going to be um, a single language in which all uh, theoretical science gets expressed. And um, it's going to have one object domain <laughs> and one set of what he calls postulates or axioms or are they what you could call axioms. Um, uh, in other words, it's going to be an axiomatized theory in the sense of that he discusses in the alpha. All the terms are going to be eliminable in some sense of eliminable in favor of the members of this one object domain and uh, all the statements are going to be deducible from these postulates plus some observational stuff which I mean I'll explain where that comes from but um, um, so that has not changed Number two, what has not changed is um, that this is supposed to be a contribution to a, cooper a cooperative enterprise, right? So it's all, he keeps saying we, he keeps saying, uh, sometimes he expands we as something like scientifically thinking men is the way he puts it. Now he's writing in English, so he doesn't have the excuse that... Um, when you're writing in German, you can use the word mensch, which doesn't mean man as opposed to woman. But now he's writing in English, so he actually literally is saying men. Um, I don't have time to talk about that, but uh, I'm pointing out to it, <laughs> pointing to it. But in any case, right, so we scientific men are basically in agreement about the main things, and my contribution here is going to be to settle certain outstanding controversies. Again, presumably, although the optimism is, you know, the faith that this is going to work must be weaker by this point. But again, presumably, because if we can finally get these controversies settled, we can go on to some great positive project together. Um, um, it has occurred to me in the past I don't know exactly what more to say about this. One of the suggested paper topics has to do with this, actually. So, you know, Carnap versus Putnam is, in their political affiliations, is very much an example of what's, you know, uh, often described as the clash between the old left and the new left in the 60s. Um, Right, Carnap was this old school democratic socialist from Europe, you know, all, um, you know, wearing a bow tie and speaking very dignified way, and and having this kind of long term project whose goals have been put off way into the future of instituting a just socialist society, and Putnam. Actually, I don't know if this was already true in 1962. It's a good question. But I know that in this period, he um, became a Maoist. And uh, he used to stand around in Harvard Square wearing, you know, uh, like kind of Viet Cong type you know, clothing and, and giving, you know, passing out communist pamphlets. <laughs> um, so he was very much part of the new um, 
uh, left who who said uh, who said uh, you know you guys are never getting anywhere um, uh, and you let this war happen and uh, um, you're implicated in war and imperialism and whatever. You're part of this system. We need, uh, you know, we need action. We need immediate protest and change and so forth. Um, there's some connection between that and the fact that Putnam is not buying into this, oh, you know, we all agree with each other about the basics the way Neurot and Putnam do when they talk to each other and just saying no you're totally wrong I'm, I'm gonna tell you how to do this better <laughs> starting right now <laughs> um, uh, and by the way my way is is in touch with your reality and yours is out of touch right so um, um, Okay, that was probably more time than I should have spent talking about. Well, again, I don't know. What's really important here? The details of how the semantic rules are going to work and whatever, or something like that. In any case, <laughs> be that as it may, so that's something that hasn't changed. Another thing that hasn't changed is that this, the whole apparatus together is going to somehow exhibit our right to use certain terms and make certain statements, our right based on our um, what we can actually claim to know about, um, and um, that the reason we want to do that fundamentally is that there should be, there's, what's going to come out of that is a criterion of meaningfulness that will um, allow we scientific men to uh, agree that and why certain statements, namely metaphysical statements, are meaningless. Right now he has given up on, and this is a big change, he has given up on the idea that um, the rules of our language will make it impossible to um, that our, our, our language will contain no meaningful meaningless terms and that the grammatical rules of our language will make it impossible to say meaningless things rather he's, even within the observation language he is gonna accept that there may be meaningless statements and what we need is a criterion that makes it clear which those statements are so we can avoid saying them so that's a big change. Do people understand the, the change I just said? Is there a question about that? So in the Aufbau system, there is no criterion of meaning, meaningfulness aside from just telling you what language to speak. Speak this language and you can be sure that whatever you say is meaningful. Is the, is the procedure in the Aufbau. By now, he's come to realize that that can't really be done, or at least has become convinced that that really can't really be done. And the proposal is rather, speak this language, and in this language, I can tell you how to, how to know whether what you say is meaningful or not, by, so to speak, a mechanical procedure. Um, without having to, um, well, without having to get involved in metaphysics yourself, basically, without having to say, oh, that must be meaningless because how could we know about blah, 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 because there's no causal chain and, you know, no, you, there's a way that you can check mechanically to tell whether what someone said was meaningful or not. Um... So, um, so that, so there has been a big change there, but the underlying idea is still there. And finally, another thing that hasn't changed is um, that this is rational reconstruction, meaning that um, we take it that we already know what science is, 
what the results of science are. Um, we're not trying to discover that. We're not trying to police science to, you know, get rid of some things that look like science, but they aren't. It's going to be important to remember this when we get to Popper, because that's something Popper is really interested in doing. But Carnap is not interested in doing that. He's assuming that, you know, we know who are scientists and we know what they think is meaningful and we agree that what they think is meaningful must be meaningful and we also agree that certain things are meaningless and the point here is not to um, change any of that but to exhibit clearly our reasons for it right that's basically what rational reconstruction is about um, Um, and a kind of subpart of that, I guess, is the term observable, which um, is going to play such a big ro role in this argument, in this dispute. I think Carnap would agree with the point that Putnam makes about this, which is that basically observable is a, is a theoretical term. It's not itself an observation term. Or I guess maybe to put it more carefully, the term observable in our customary language, once we translate it into the new language that he's suggesting that we adopt, at least as it occurs in discussions of scientific methodology, is going to be translated into one of the terms of the theoretical language, LT, not one of the terms of the observation language, LO. Um, um, That's okay because um, we're not using this to build up in a foundational way um, our, you know, um, our right to scientific language is based on nothing or based on something that we can immediately claim ownership of. In that case, of course, the fact that that thing could only be meant, could only be described using a theoretical term would be bad. It would mean that it's, so there's something circular here. But again, this is just like what I said about the Aufbau. That's not the point. Um, all that has to happen for the rational reconstruction to cons to succeed is that it will turn out that the that the use of observable in the theoretical language, um, sure enough, does pick out the the um, the translation of the terms we're going to use in the observation language. Right? So if everything fits together, so when you're doing rational reconstruction, when you're doing like policing or like building up from foundation to make sure you're right, like the way Descartes is doing in the meditations, then uh, what's important is that you start without making any presuppositions or something like that, especially not theoretical, empirical presuppositions. But when what, you're do, when what you're doing is rational reconstruction, what's important is just that everything fits together when you're done. Okay, so all of that hasn't changed. And moreover, in some sense, the basic strategy hasn't changed. So the strategy in the Aufbau was um, to take care of these things. Well, I mean, there was a twofold strategy to take care of the unity of science. The strategy was to like show how to reduce everything to one object domain and to take care of the meaningfulness thing. The strategy was to um, have this object domain be something that um, it's not controversial, is meaningful. Um, 
because it's clear that we have the right to talk about it. Um, that is, because we all agree in advance, again, before we even start this project, that we have a right to talk about this, something like that. And then, step by step, we have a procedure for kind of transmitting meaningfulness from this level to the higher levels. So we use those same set of levels in the Aufbau to do both of them. Right now, I pointed out in the unity of science, it's already the, what's doing each of them has already, you know, been separated from each other. Um, in the, so in this system of the methodological character of theoretical concepts, there are two languages. One is called the observation language, LO, and the other is called the theoretical language, LT. By the way, why does Carnap like so much introducing these letters um, that kind of stand for something like observation or theory to the point where when you translate from German, this, as I said, was originally in English. But when you translate the older works from German, a lot of times you have to change the letter to preserve the, that it will stand for the right thing, right? So... Um, um, why does he like doing that? Well, you know, he's trying to emphasize that we know what words mean in our customary language and that that's important and that we need to be able to do that to get anywhere, to, to talk to each other in our customary language, but that we're engaged in setting up a new language which will have its own words, which um, at least... Uh, to begin with, you can't presuppose or equivalent to any words in our old language, and it, you know. But then, by convention, we're going to set up a relationship between them. So, you know, that's why he likes to have these symbols that sort of suggest a word in our ordinary language, but um, but are clearly not the same as it, and clearly, in some sense, arbitrary. I could have called it Q instead of T. Okay. So anyway. So the observation language is supposed to be, is, is pretty much like the Aufbau language. In some sense, it's even maybe more restrictive than the Aufbau language in terms of what you're allowed to do in it. Um, it has as its basis, he basically adopts that suggestion from the unity of science that the basis should be in the thing world, right? So rather than having our immediate, my experiences or something, the, the basis is going to be an intersubjective basis and it's going to consist of statements like there is a red ball on the table now or there's a red sphere on the table now or something like that. But then, you know, new terms can be introduced in this language by um, um, something like definition, just like in the Alpha language. So in this language, um, unless maybe we decide to allow some disposition terms. Uh, if I have time, I'll say more about what disposition terms are, but they're terms like soluble that I mentioned before. Um, uh, but in the, at least in the strict form, and that's what he decides that we should do, in the strict form, it's still going to be the case that everything you can say in this language can be translated into um, statements about the basic object domain. And the basic object domain is, again, supposed to be something that we agree we have a right to talk about. So, you know, so he's, he, I think he still has taken on that lesson that he learned for, from Neurath, even though it wasn't what Neurath wanted to teach him, <laughs> that this, this choice is conventional. We legislate that these things are going to count as the given, but of course we do it because we're all willing to accept those statements without further proof or something like that. 
So, um, so that's the observation language. So in the, the observation language, if we could only speak that, it would make it clear um, um, I mean, first of all, that if science could be stated in the observation language, then science would be unified in the same way it was in the alphabet. And number two, if we could only speak the observation language, then it would be clear that what we're saying is meaningful for the same reason in the alphabet. I say that even though, as I mentioned, he seems to indicate that even in the observation language, we may need a criterion for meaningfulness. Why? He may actually already be thinking of examples like the one Putnam mentions of, you know, there are people too small to see on this table, um, that you can use empirically meaningful terms um, in even a pretty simple grammar to say things that can't be empirically uh, tested at all. Now, I mean, the thing about there's people too small to see, of course, you might think, well, you could test that because they'll build cities or like in the Dr. Seuss book, Horton hears a hoo, they'll get a megaphone and they'll yell in your ear. <laughs> um, and if you have elephant ears, you'll notice <laughs> that someone's talking to you, you know, but, um, but, uh, uh, imagine, you know, the sentence, there's people who have no observable effects, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, you probably can express that in the observation language and that would be meaningless. But in any case, like at least Carnap says, we all understand how to have a criterion for meaningfulness in the observation language. So I'm not going to go into that even. But the theoretical language, now he's accepted that to actually say the things that scientists want to say, um, you have to get very far away from this. Um, and the theoretical language is going to look like this. The basis of it um, is going to be and he gives a semantic description of this now, which means um, he's gone on beyond the idea that to propose a language is only to give it syntax. He says now to propose a language is to give, you know, the rules for what counts as a valid sentence and for inferences of one sentence from another, and also to say what kind of domain of objects the variables of that language are supposed to um, take on as their values. And so what he says here is that um, the original individual, that an individual as opposed to class variables or set variables in this language, the original individual variables of this language, um, the values they're supposed to take on are members of a certain domain of objects. And the domain of objects contains um, um, objects that can be described as having a successor relation to each other. One of them can be called O, one can be called O prime, one can be called O prime prime prime, I mean O prime prime, etc. Um, and in short, this domain of objects is um, isomorphic to the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, etc. That is, it's isomorphic to what in our ordinary language we call the natural numbers in our customary language, in the part of it that we use to talk about mathematics. Um, so, um, so in the alphabet terminology, you could see this as saying the fundamental objects are natural numbers, and the, or the, the, the basis is in natural numbers, and the fundamental relation is the succession relation between natural numbers. Right, the relation that says m is the number that comes after m. 
Um, and there's going to be a postulate about that, an axiom about that relation or, or, or set of axioms about it that, you know, that says, for example, there is some object that is not the successor of any object. That will be what corresponds to the number one. And then there'll be a bunch of others, right? You know, like um, that every object only has exactly one successor. There'll be, has to be an axiom of induction, of, of uh, mathematical induction. That's always the hard one. But anyway, some stuff like that, they will ensure that these things behave like the natural numbers do, whatever they are. And then, so that's one thing that will be in T, this basis in the natural numbers, so to speak. There also will be um, um, a way to, to introduce new terms into this language. And um, basically, so now he's going to allow um, um, the formation of sets and there's going to be postulates of set theory too, presumably. So this is going to allow um, um, a much more complicated hierarchy than the hierarchy of classes that we allowed in the Aufbau. Why? Because you can prove that there are more sets than there are uh, descriptions that you can write in any finite, in any language with a finite vocabulary. Um, so it's going to be possible, in particular, there's more real numbers than there are anything you can talk about in a language with a finite vocabulary. So we're going to be able to prove that um, um, on higher levels there are of this system, there are more objects than we have names for. Whereas over here in the observational language, it's going to turn out, because of all the restrictions he places on it, that you can show, on the contrary, that there must be a way of describing every, a unique way of describing every individual object at every level. So, in other words, this language is, first of all, has its basis in something that we don't clearly have a right to talk about. On the contrary, there's an infinite number of natural numbers. How do we even know about them? <laughs> um, uh, and number two, the way that you get in new terms is going to be... Um, uh, complicated enough that it's not clear that it that it transmits the right to talk about things. Um, and finally, the language T is going to contain, it contains these mathematical postulates. That he, I mean, I don't know, maybe these are supposed to be included in here, but he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about them. But it contains a set of postulates or axioms that he calls T, so, I mean, you could think of it as just one long axiom that's all of those axioms like anded together, the conjunction of all the axioms. He thinks of it as a set of axioms, T. And what are those axioms going to be? They're supposed to be fundamental physical laws. Now, you might say, wait, how can there be fundamental physical laws in this language? This language is, is just about mathematics. You just said the basis of it is the natural numbers. And the way we get to higher levels is by set theory. Um, so the answer is, when we say these are fundamental physical laws, these are laws that describe certain functions. They say things like you know, uh, there is a function such that dh dt equals zero. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a function that, you know, from a certain, uh, like, um, n tuple of physical quantities to a real number and its derivative with respect to 
um, some other physical quantity that we're calling T is zero, but the physical part here doesn't do anything. So, I mean, it's just like, it's a function from n, n tuples of real, num of real numbers to real numbers. And um, when you take its derivative with respect to a certain um, one of its arguments, you get zero. And um, that might be one of the postulates. And, the, and so it's just a statement about mathematics that like in this, that there is some function that does this. And then of course that function will have to appear in the other axioms so that this will have some content. And the intention will be, let's say that H stands for the Hamiltonian. Like basically you can think of it as the energy of the system. This would be in a certain kind of formulation of classical mechanics. And, you know, this is the law of the conservation of energy. But what makes it a law of the conservation of energy? What makes it, to put it differently, what makes it mean anything about the real world? That is, what makes it empirically meaningful? Not the fact that you can translate that into a long, long statement about the natural numbers. Um, or in other words, not the fact that, uh, um, uh, a certain way of assigning these objects to values of the variables of our language are going to make it true. What is supposed to make it to show that it's empirically meaningful? Well, it's got to somehow, and this, again, this thought hasn't changed. <laughs> it's got to somehow connect with the things that we actually see and feel, etc. It's just the description of how it connects is now much more complicated and much weaker. I mean, after all, you can't tell by looking at something whether energy has been conserved. Um, um, it could, the, the internal energy of the system could have changed very slightly in a way that has no effects on your experience. Um, that's part of what physicists want to say. So that's part of what this proposal is supposed to make meaningful and true. <laughs> um, so what is the connection? Well, the connection is this. We take certain sentences in the observation language, and by convention, we regard them as equivalent to certain special sentences in the theoretical language. This sentence, the, the axiom that I just wrote up, is not going to be one of them. But there's going to be a way in the physical language to say something like the observable, or sorry, let me put it this way. There's going to be sentences in the observation language that say something like, um, um, this region of space at a certain time feels warm. And there's going to be a sentence in the physical language that says something like, um, the value of a certain function from quadruples of real numbers to real numbers is greater than so-and-so in a certain set of those quadruples, <laughs> right? So, and we're gonna, we want to, that sentence of the system language to mean the temperature in a certain space-time region is greater than so-and-so. 
And the way we make it mean that is by conventionally taking it to be equivalent to this sentence of the observation language. So a few sentences will be translatable back and forth between the observation language and the theoretical language. And then, since there's clearly no time for me to talk about this, I'll just say, then again, there's going to be a story about how that, so, so this sentence in the, in the theoretical language is definitely meaningful. And then there's going to be a story about how that meaningfulness gets transmitted step by step to, um, um, well, first of all, to the, to the terms that are contained in other statements, and then, um, therefore, the meaningfulness will get transmitted to all the statements of the theoretical language that have those meaningful terms. And the, the rough procedure is to just ask about this sentence that we want to know, is, or to ask about this term, I guess these are supposed to be sentences, um, but anyway, we want to know if a certain term, you know, blah, blah, is an empirically meaningful term. So we ask, is there a statement containing only the term blah, blah, that implies some of these um, um, theoretical statements that are equivalent to observational statements? So if there is, then blah, blah is an empirically meaningful term. Right? Because it means there is a statement that contains only blah, blah that makes a difference to what we would see or feel or whatever. Even though many statements containing blah, blah might not make a difference. Those will also be counted as empirically meaningful, even though they're di not directly empirically meaningful, but they have an empirically meaningful term. So they talk about something we're allowed to talk about, and that, at this stage, Carnap says is enough. And in particular, it will be enough to draw the line between science and metaphysics. Okay, there's a lot more to say about that, but I need to get on to Putnam. So are there questions? Okay, so Putnam's attack on this. Um, I mean, I think there's four main parts to it. They have something in common, but I'm just going to say what they are. First of all, he says... There's no such thing as an observational term. Um, because, he says, every term can be used to talk about things that are unobservable. And that's where that example comes in, people too small to be seen. Um, uh, you know that sentence contains terms that are presumably going to occur in Carnap's observation language. People, small, <laughs> seen, you know, uh, um, I mean, actually that may contain a disposition term. I'm not sure because it's like seeable. Um, uh, but, um, anyway, um, presumably there's a way to fix that up. I'm not actually sure there is, but anyway, let's take it for granted there is. So <laughs> Putnam's, uh, Putnam's first objection is there's no such thing as a purely observational term. All terms can be used to talk about observation, observable and non-observable things. Number two, that what Carnap calls a theoretical term Carnap says, I mean Putnam says there is such thing as a theoretical term, namely a term that belongs to some scientific theory. But 
he says that um, what Carnap calls a theoretical term is not that. For example, there's some theoretical terms, and this, this uh, example he discusses is satellite, right? He says uh, satellite is a theoretical term. I guess it's a term of Newtonian uh, gravitation theory, or I'm not sure what he has in mind. But anyway, uh, satellite is a uh, theoretical term. It's a term of a scientific theory. Um, but satellites, by and large, are observable. Right? I mean, you can see them. Uh, at least if you're close enough to them, you can see them with the unaided eye. And uh, um, that's the same thing for hold, that holds for a term like red, right? I mean, if you're close enough to something, you can see with the unaided eye whether it's red or not, if the lights are on, etc. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so he's saying what Carnap calls theoretical terms are not, there are, is such a thing as theoretical terms, but it's not what Carnap calls theoretical terms. Thirdly, he says he, he attacks Carnap's phrase partial interpretation or partially interpreted. I guess I didn't mention this when I was discussing Carnap, but because of that loose connection between the theoretical language and the observational language, he, Carnap says that the, the, uh, the theoretical language or the terms or statements of the theoretical language or all three are only partially interpreted. Um, um, that is, we're calling them all meaningful, but we're calling them meaningful, or we're calling the whole package meaningful, only because in part, partly, in some way, it is equivalent to things we can say in the observation language. But um, Putnam says, number one, this a uh, phrase partially interpreted, people throw it around, but no one's ever said exactly what they mean by it. And now Putnam is going to ask what you plausibly might mean by it. And he gives three different possibilities, and he said none of these could plausibly be said about scientific theories. Therefore, if the claim is that theoretical language, theoretical terms, whatever, are only partially interpreted, it's just false. And then the last thing he says is... There is no problem here. That even if somehow you could fix all of this up to get out of his objections, there would be no point in doing it because what is all this apparatus supposed to do? And, you know, he says, well, I guess apparently it's supposed to explain either um, how it is that we learn to use theoretical terms or how it is that we can introduce new theoretical terms. And Putnam says, either way, there's no mystery about that. We do it all the time. And that's the end of the story, right? I mean, he says how we do it. Um, and it doesn't require this apparatus to say how we do it. Um, he says, uh, sure enough, it would be impossible to understand how we did it if we ever went around speaking this observation language with only observational terms, then yeah, we would not be able to learn theoretical terms or introduce new theoretical terms in that case. But, you know, and that's the end, what Panup says at the end of the paper, you know, thank heavens, we're, we're never in that situation and that's why we can do it. <laughs> um. We don't even have any observational terms at all, let alone was there a time when we only used those or something like that. 
Are there questions about what I just said? There have been no questions at all for a long time, and I take that as a bad sign, but I don't know what to do about it. Because I usually, if no one's asking a question, I take it as a sign, not that everyone understood everything, but that everyone found everything so hard to understand that they can't even think of a question. <laughs> uh, but okay, I can't force questions to exist, so I'll just keep going. Um, so, um, so what I want to say about this is that on the one hand, all of these attacks on Carnap are, in a sense, very unfair. Um, they seem to be based on a misunderstanding or perhaps worse, a misrepresentation of what it is Carnap is trying to do. Um, and I would like to try to explain that, but in case I run out of time while I'm doing that, I'm going to... This is kind of bad because it... No, maybe I shouldn't. Because I want to say, on the other hand, why... So I just have to remember to stop in time to do this. I want to say, on the other hand, why on another level you can understand Putnam as... Um, having a really serious attack against Carnap. Well, I guess I will say, at least in general terms, how that could be. How could it be that it's both unfair and based on a misunderstanding and really a serious attack? Because this is something that happens a lot in the history of philosophy, I think, which is that um, philosopher B um, feels that uh, there is no such thing to say as what philosopher A is trying to say, <laughs> right? That is, that philosopher A um, um, just isn't making sense at all. So they can't take on they can't let philosopher A say, explain their position the way they would because in order to criticize it, because they can't make any sense of that, so they can't criticize it. So the way the critique will appear is something like that you say, well, what could this mean? And then you supply, so to speak, the nearest thing that makes any sense to you to what philosopher A says. <laughs> um, so I think, I mean, like I said, I think you can see this in lots of places. You can see, you know, um, Barclay doing this to Locke, for example, uh, but there's many, many examples of it, I think. Um, and, uh, um, I think Putnam is doing something that, like that to Carnap here. So in that way, in a, like in a sense, your criticism is wrong because your version of philosopher A is not saying what philosopher A would actually say. So it's, it's unfair. You're not letting philosopher A present their case the way they would. And on the contrary, you're, you're, attributing, you're attributing something to them which if you ask them, they would they would reject. They would say, no, I don't mean that. <laughs> but in a sense, you're being charitable to them because you're allowing them to say something that makes sense to you, <laughs> right? Like you're reinterpreting what they said in a way that you're at least able to criticize, and then you criticize that. And so the critique actually is pretty strong, even though it's unfair because, because of the implicit part that says, like, um, you think you're saying something different than this thing that I'm criticizing, but you're wrong about that. Like, 
your only choice, if you were thinking clearly, would be to say this thing that I'm criticizing. Okay, so uh, I, I only have 10 minutes and I, I want both to explain why it's unfair and say what Putnam is trying to do. I don't think there's really time for that, but um, let me just pick um, Putnam's first point here. Because I think it's pretty emblem, you know, like emblematic of what happens here, and yet it's. I probably should say something about this too, but, and and yet it's uh, simpler to explain than talking about some of this stuff. So like. Um, Carnap doesn't claim that our customary language contains any observation terms. He never says that. He says that this rational reconstruction language, right, this language that we're proposing to adopt, or, you know, at least to speak as if we were thinking of adopting it or something like that, um, is going to contain two parts, one of which will be called the observational language. And by definition, the descriptive, that is like non-logical terms that, exist, that, that are contained in the observation language are gonna be called observational terms. So, um, um, So there is no claim that any term that we ordinarily use is an observational term. It can only be used to express ob observations or something like that. But moreover, Carnap doesn't even claim that all the sentences in the observation language, LO, are translations of things that we usually call obser you know, observation reports. He doesn't claim that either, actually, that all or only the sentences in LO are translations of what we call observation reports. On the one hand, LO has resources for introducing higher object types, and even, although I said it's not clear exactly how this is going to happen, but apparently for saying things that are meaningless. Right, so not every sentence that can be expressed in LO is gonna be an observation sentence. But he also says that um, in this, uh, rather than use my document camera, I'm just gonna read it. This is on page 49 of Carnap's paper. What physicists often call observable magnitudes are not observable in the sense customary in philosophical discussions of methodology and therefore belong to the theoretical concepts in our terminology. Right, and he gives examples like mass and charge and whatever. So, right, so what he's saying is that um, the things that we ordinarily call observation reports in our ordinary language, many or perhaps all of them, if we adopted this proposed system form, are not going to be translated into sentences of LO. They're going to be translated into sentences of LT. And it's not that's not news to him. <laughs> he's right, he's he said that to begin with. That's built into the system. So when Putnam says, you know, starts off by saying, like, this is on page 216 in Putnam's paper, in the first place, it should be noted that the dichotomy under discussion, observational versus theoretical, was intended as an explicative and not merely a stipulative one, right? That is, which means, roughly speaking, this term observational is supposed to be the same as our ordinary term observational, that's just not true. <laughs> That's not what Carnap is doing with it. It's somehow related to our ordinary term observational, but it's a technical term that Carnap is using to um, describe how to set up a certain system language. 
So the whole criticism is unfair and like deeply unfair. Um, and similarly, when you get to this, which is what's really important to Carnap, what problem is Carnap trying to solve? How do we learn theoretical terms? That's the question of empirical psychology, according to Carnap. Right? How do we introduce them? That's also an empirical question. Carnap would agree with Putnam. What is the problem? It's not a theoretical problem, it's a practical problem. And the problem is, how can we speak such as to make it clear that we have a right to say what we're saying? Um, that we're using our terms responsibly such that um, we can prevent interminable disputes and can rule out these pseudo sentences that would say things like, you have no ethical duty because free will is impossible. That's the problem. So again, Putnam isn't allowing Carnap the problem he wants to have, and he's foisting these other problems on him. So it's unfair. So, but why, so now let me try to fill in the second piece. Unless, are there questions about that so far? Why, at least in those two cases, I'm saying it's unfair? And I think, you know, if I had more time, I would explain why these are unfair also. So I think what's really going on here in Putnam is that if you like if you pay attention and that's why I said these all have something in common if you pay attention to what Putnam is doing throughout his paper he continually insists on using all terminology in our customary, ordinary way. In other words, what Putnam is doing here is related to, although Putnam isn't really part of this movement, but it's related to a movement that was huge in the 50s called Ordinary Language Philosophy um, in, the, in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, so he's, um, whenever Carnap tries to introduce a technical term or to use a term in a special philosophical way, like observation, theory, interpretation, language, meaning, change of meaning, right, this uh, physical object, all these things, you can go through the pit, and, and every time what Putnam does is just say, well, I know how to use that word. I know what we call a theory. I know what we call an observation. I know what we call a change in meaning. This isn't a change in meaning. This isn't a theory. This isn't an observation, etc. He's insisting on, um, as Wittgenstein puts it, bringing these words back home to the way we actually use them. So it's a different vision of what it means to speak responsibly, number one. Um, maybe it's somehow connected to their political differences, although, like I said, I don't know how to make that out. But if you think how to make it out, you could write a paper about it for this course. <laughs> um, so, um, um, but in any case, there's a different, you know, what it means to speak responsibly, to use language in a way that is actually consistent with using it as a means of communication, is to use words the way we ordinarily use them. And I think from that point of view, you could take the criticism of overall criticism of Carnap as something like this. Um, Carnap's whole idea of a quote unquote adopting a new language only appears to make sense because Carnap is abusing our old 
existing language in describing what we're going to do. If Carnap himself would speak responsibly, he would find that he couldn't say what he wants to say. Okay, um, that's it for today. Um, uh, this is our last reading from Carnap. So we say goodbye to Carnap. Probably most of you will say good riddance, although I love Carnap. <laughs> um, and I just want to mention one other thing, which is that uh, in 10 minutes we have a philosophy colloquium. I believe the invitation should have been sent to all the undergrad majors, at least. Um, yeah, in 10 minutes, 3.15. Well, now in nine minutes. Um, so uh, I definitely, a speaker is very interesting, so I definitely encourage everyone to come to that. And I hopefully we'll see you there, if not next week. Um,